Yeah, my part's short. It's just welcome everybody back. Thank you for joining. It's been a little bit of a break, and so it's fun to have these things going again. And uh, we have a pretty good sign up. Uh, we had about 45 people sign up. I don't know how many people actually end up joining, but it'll be a nice, nice group, and we'll uh, <clears throat> free it up for discussion later. I'm going to turn this over to our moderator, John Bach, who can introduce our speakers. We have a panel discussion, it turned out to be, and a really interesting subject called uh, teaching quality to students versus executives. And I have to, when I looked at that, I, I thought about it for a while, and I think I've spent probably the majority of the last 25 years teaching software quality to executives rather than students. I know John has spent a lot of time teaching to students, so it'll be really interesting to hear the, the different perspectives. Anyway, enjoy it. I'm going to sign off the screen, and um, I will be back on afterwards. Hey, Rob, I saw I just saw you down there, Rob Savern. Oh, yes. I will talk to everybody in a bit. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Over to you, John. For years, I've uh, uh, been in software development in the quality arena, and I've run into colleagues like Adam and Mike, um, uh, well, first acquaintances that become colleagues because of their insight and their, their passion for this craft of development of, uh, of software. Um, and uh, for many years, it's been a pleasure to be a moderator just because I get my selfish need met of uh, talking directly to people who have more insight than I do about things that matter to me. It occurred to me a few weeks ago that in uh, my uh, Mike McKee here, uh, the, who is an assistant teacher uh, professor at Seattle University in the computer science department, uh, last couple of years he's asked me to speak to his class. And uh, he's been full time there for five years and served as an adjunct there for 15 years, primarily teaching database software testing and various other engineering classes to both the graduate and undergraduate levels. And, um, and then Adam White, who recently started his consulting practice, AKW Consulting, uh, he's been in quality for years, uh, also in compliance and kind of all things engineering. Um, he's got a background as a senior R&D leader and product builder with 20 years of experience in commercializing med tech and SaaS and IT infrastructure products. He's on a, on a group of colleagues, um, uh, known as the band, uh, playfully speaking with uh, with my brother James and a few others. So when I thought about what kind of topic I'd be interested in and what colleagues I have to bring to bear, it seems to me that Adam with his new consulting practice, he's in the business now of especially talking to executives about software testing. And Mike, of course, is educating our next uh, generation of uh, uh, people who will join our profession, if not already. Uh, and what he teaches them about software testing and what are the overlaps and what are the orthogonalities or the things that are separate. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to have a, a new interesting discussion in both of those perspectives. So what I'd like to do next uh, is uh, throw to uh, Adam and have him do his own intro and talk about this topic um, for a couple of minutes. And uh, and then I'll do the same for Mike uh, or Mike McKee, and um, and then we'll go. And I have a few questions prepared, but uh, if if they're going to be insightful, I reserve the right to kind of riff and uh, improvise uh, on some questions that they may not know I'm going to ask. But uh, so without further ado, um, Adam, what do you think of this topic uh, about uh, teaching software to executives, and how might it be similar to what Mike's domain might be, or, or how generally does this hit you uh, as uh, important things to, to raise? Yeah, when you reached out about this question, uh, with this question, I, it was interesting. Um, I had to do some thinking about the different ways that I've tried to teach it successfully and unsuccessfully and, and all the people that have been involved in, in helping me do that. So um, it's... Uh, it's definitely been a journey, and and you mentioned some of the background, you know, uh, that that we've known each other for many years now, and um, I've worked in a lot of different domains, and there's a lot of different views on quality, 
um, that, that come up in the different domains that I've worked in. So I worked in medical robotics for four years and uh, I ran an engineering team, an R&D team there. Um, so I wasn't in quality like I was when we first met back in the early days, but I still had to have an eye towards quality and know what was going on in those areas. And the definition of quality when you're working on a medical robot and there's something hanging above someone's brain during a surgery is very different than what I'm working on, let's say business software, um, the stakes are different and there could be money on the line, which is still important. So you, you have to find a way to balance those things. Um, but when you asked me about teaching uh, executives in particular, um, I, and I've been on this topic lately is, is it's, I've learned that it's about meeting people where they're at. So I can come in with this grandiose definition of quality and I can try to, you know, bring everybody to my vision, but I find it's easier if I um, meet them where they're currently at. So I ask a lot of questions at the beginning and I use a lot of analogies. So I'll listen to an executive and the stories they tell. Um, and it might even be a, a personal story, excuse me. and um, what I'll do is I'll loop that into my stories later on. Um, you know, even if let's say they have an opinion about the quality of Apple computers over Windows computers. That's that's a great one because now it gives me something to go on. Why do you think an Apple computer is higher quality? Or why do you think a Windows computer is higher quality? And I'll, I guess the thing that I've been most successful with is actually James's uh, heuristic test strategy model and using the quality criteria that's listed in that and um, letting people know that when you often hear from an executive we have a quality problem I'm like really T tell me tell me more like that's just the first question um, in a series of questions to come so what do you mean by a quality problem and you when you dig down into the the layers you get into to James's quality criteria. And that's been the most effective one I've seen at explaining it to VP of Eng, uh, to CTOs, to CEOs, um, because then we can actually talk about something concrete. Did I go long enough there? <laughs> oh, perfect. That's perfect. Thank you, Adam. Okay, good. Because I, I wrote a couple ideas for questions. So yeah. great. Uh, okay, my same question to you. What what resonates to you most about this topic? Uh, and now that you've heard Adam, uh, feel free to juxtapose your answer with anything oh, he might say. Sure. Uh, first, uh, when I first heard the topic and I and I heard saw that keyword versus, uh, I immediately thought, okay, is he setting us up for like a debate or a conflict or or something like that? So I naturally I got a little little defensive uh, at, at first until I realized where it was going. Um, we have to realize we're doing what two very distinct audiences, uh, dealing with students who uh, are not really working full time and, and some of them have never been exposed to uh, any category, you know, any any type of software testing. Uh, and so um, essentially what uh, what I deal with a lot of times in, in my profession as a, a teacher, uh, we, we have a, a variety of different classes that's in uh, for a college curriculum for software uh, engineering and computer science. Uh, we have a distinct one called software testing and debugging, which I think uh, John spoke at uh, once or twice along with his brother. Um, but for the other classes, they're mainly things like algorithms or programming languages. Uh, so I was actually kind of curious because I've taught uh, some of them, uh, but testing has not been a huge priority because we're actually working on uh, kind of a, a limited amount of time. Um, but uh, so I, I I queried the faculty recently. I, I gave them uh, an email a few days ago. I said, "Can you guys tell me your your testing experiences in your in your uh, various classes?" And I got a couple responses, but uh, I'll be very honest. Uh, it was it was pretty minimal. Uh, I would say that the most of the testing that the students are exposed to at the college uh, university that I'm at right now have been uh, primarily in in several classes that I've taught uh, recently. We have one called um, um, computing systems fundamentals, where it's a very group project during a class. And one of the criteria that we have for the students is to get 100% code coverage on unique code that they develop. Um, so they're exposed to the concept of automated testing, along with unit testing, and along with the ambitious goal of 100% um, code coverage. So it's uh, 
they're getting exposed to that. They don't like it <laughs> uh, sometimes because they're, they're realizing they have to code about twice as much lines sometimes uh, to do it. But uh, we're we're uh, basically trying to expose them to that element of, of testing. I mean, there is we d definitely go into the various theories behind uh, software testing, but I think uh, these pragmatic skills is what I'm trying to do in a, in a variety of different classes, to, uh, because when they get out in industry, uh, many of them have come on to say that I'm glad you we learned unit testing in your class because uh, we find it very relevant for our work. Um, as for a, just a brief bio, I think James John did a really good job kind of introducing, but I got into academia uh, kind of late. Uh, I did, had about a 30 year career as a software engineer, project manager, consulting, uh, all sorts of different things for uh, a data, database, uh, middleware and database integration company. Um, and so I got, I definitely was on the front lines uh, with a lot of the, uh, the various uh, products that we developed, uh, a lot in coding, lot, certainly a lot in uh, uh, testing and, and various things. But I'll be honest with you, I had kind of a, a, a little bit negative relationship with a lot of the QA and the testing for, for uh, a number of years, because I always kind of thought the QAs were just a little bit uh, not on the same level as as a developer. Uh, that, that has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, especially as I got into academia and, and got exposed um, to to reading, you know, various uh, to interacting with John's John and James, and just seeing all the elements of testing. So uh, I have a number of testing books, and I find it a fascinating topic. And I'm really just uh, honored to be here. Great answer. All right, thank you, Mike, for that. Um, all right, well, let's let me stay with you, Mike, for for the first question. I wanted to make sure to ask you both. That yep. is, um, what do you find to be a really effective technique in your teaching? Okay, I think for this, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I created a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to really bore you with PowerPoints, uh, but I will read from it uh, briefly some of the comments that I have. So uh, some of the techniques that I, have worked for me, actually, let me just go over some of the techniques that haven't worked, <laughs> because in the in the five years that I've been doing full-time teaching, uh, there's definitely been some things that have, have not worked in um, introducing material to students, and some of them is... Uh, where uh, I know there's a tendency for me to want to go to, to be random, uh, to basically get the feel for, for my audience and, and just to go off. Uh, but I found that uh, a majority of my students are very, uh, very structured, very organized, very analytical. And uh, through comments, they really don't like that. <laughs> they, they, wanted, they want to basically be, uh, be on the material. So I've had to kind of modify my tendency and uh, work uh, to stay on topic a little bit. So if there's, you know, if a student goes into a different area on a question where I could be easily talk for another 10, 15 minutes and miss some important material that I had chosen to kind of go over, I don't do that anymore. So I try to do that. Uh, another thing is that you learn when you're teaching. Uh, you learn what works for you and what doesn't work for me. Uh, I always thought that, you know, a teacher or somebody who's presenting should, should be somebody uh, very polished, humorous, storyteller. <clears throat> but I found that, uh, you know, that that's not my natural gifts to be, you know, to, to tell jokes in the beginning of class or to try to, uh, in fact, when I've ever have done that, they failed dramatically <laughs> where I get silence. Uh, so I've learned to kind of uh, go with what works for me. And that is, a, and so some of the techniques that I have found that works the best is uh, getting a lot more organized. So when I got into academia full time five years ago, I, I organized uh what I call my, you know, our classes can be up to three hours. So probably about every 15 to 20 minutes, there's a different thing that I'm doing. So there's kind of like very short lectures followed by a group activity. Uh, I'm really heavily involved into this concept of teaching uh, called problem-based uh, learning approach, which is essentially taking, uh, you're working, uh, you pre present a problem to the students. It might be an impossible problem. It could be vague, ambiguous, whatever, but um, they, you know, I, I set them up for it and then I let them loose. And so essentially that's uh, what I'll do. I'll give you some examples. Um, of some of the assignments that I or I do maybe within the class. So let me just bring it over here real quick. So I think everybody can hopefully see my screen right now. Okay. 
Um, so this is like an activity that I might give. So uh, I basically I print it out or not print it out, but give it to them on their Canvas site, uh, give it to their groups, and they'll do these various steps, uh, step by step to some extent, but certainly a lot of their own latitude for doing things. So uh, they'll essentially go through these various steps. Uh, in this case, they were creating a, um, you know, a, a lucid chart template, a component diagram using a UML. And then at the end of it, uh, usually give them about 15, 20 minutes. And then the, what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring them back to the class and time permitting, we'll, we'll have each group present uh, some of their findings and so that they'll get the chance to also present it. Um, the second thing, this is uh, from a testing class. Uh, uh, we were doing uh, boundaries conditions. And so I was saying, saying you know, again, as a group, they would describe the process. You came up with doing the numbers. Um, by going to these various websites, and uh, they would also uh, look at this function and um, don't have to uh, write the code, but but they had to basically follow the instructions. Uh, I don't really care if they have it complete. I don't really care if they have it correct. All I care that they do it and and kind of present it. So that those are some of the approaches that I used. So. Um, those seem to uh, work for me and, and some of the approaches that I do. But I guess the other big one, <clears throat> and this, again, the class time is really only a minor part of it. It's maybe 25%. The other part is the uh, the relevant assignments that that I do give. And everything that I do in class at, at Seattle U is a group project because I'm a huge believer after being in industry for so many years that they need to be, to, to work on teams. They need to be on a group, uh, basically a quarter long project doing something relevant uh, using Git, GitHub, and uh, and getting that element of being a software team. So that those are the styles that seem to work for me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, Adam, yeah, same question. Uh, really effective techniques in, in how you would uh, educate executives enough to feel like you've reached them. I think I kind of answered that in my other in my intro statement, but uh, I'll, I'll I wrote some notes here for myself. So one of the things that um, I'm going to call it the context driven community that, you know, I was a part of in my early career and still participate in today. Um, we would talk a lot about telling the story of the product and telling the story of the testing that we did. And then I also. I can't remember if we came up with this together or if this was um, uh, one that I added in because I liked it. I would tell the story of the project as well. So, um, you know, a lot of times testers get asked, why is testing taking so long? And uh, I had some really effective ways to describe that as well. So I kind of start there with my framework. And then the one of the most effective ways um, that I've seen that really resonates with people. A lot of executives only know how to count test cases and that's all they've ever been exposed to. What's your test case percentage? You know, tell me the numbers. And so sometimes I have to BS a little bit because I don't actually have those numbers um, because I don't track them. So I, what I do is I, I give them something um, that looks like session-based testing statistics and then I also offer them the low tech testing dashboard. So, you know, your brother James influenced me very heavily in my early career. And I actually, I'll share a slide of like, this is a, an actual dashboard. I've, I've whitewashed it so that it's not, it's yeah, also please. from, it's from a long time ago. Um, yeah. But this is, this is taking a real product and putting the components down the left. Th this kind of a visual was inspired by James's low tech testing dashboard. And then I've kind of made it my own over the years and, and, and modified it. So what I'm looking for, my goal in explaining to executives, I actually turned it inward or more, could my parents understand this? And I would, my mom at one point was actually a software tester at the same time as me. Very weird <laughs> story. I won't go into the background, but I used to send her pictures like this and be like, mom, could I ship today? And she could tell me. And that was like, if I knew if my mom could understand it, then I could explain it to an executive and 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 the executive would understand it. This was in the, you got to realize that context was a little bit different. This was, I've done a lot of different roles since I did quality. And I, I actually didn't explain my background quite properly. 
I left quality and I went into general engineering management for about the last 10 or 12 years. And I most recently was head of engineering at a blockchain company, not a scam. Um, and uh, and I was I built an architecture from the ground up and did all kinds of fun things there. Um, and then that's when I decided to go consulting. So a lot of people are calling me because I'm consulting now. They're calling me because of my quality background that I did, you know, in the in the early 2000s. And because of stuff like this, because people still remember it as being super useful and a way to describe in, a, in very simple terms, like everybody here can kind of look at this. And after you get oriented to the colors, you can see that, um, you know, uh, the test effort was good on a lot of things. Um, you know, we we discovered uh, an issue in here, and this all made sense in the context. Um, you know, everybody understood how to interpret this chart, um, and it it was phenomenal. The the numbers that are in the um, in the cells are the bug numbers, so you could go. They were actually linked to the bug tracking system, so you could click right in the chart and go to the bug system and and read about the actual issue. Um, and this was back in the day when we actually had an EXE to test. This was pre SAS days of like continuous integration. This was, you know, the, the test team got to build. I know this is hard to imagine, but the test team got to build in the morning, <laughs> right? And we would test on that build all day and we would see what we would find. And then we would, you know, report things through the day. So this has actually been one of the best ways that I offer executives to understand the state of the product instead of asking me for test case coverage, tell me your percentage coverage. Yeah, okay, that's that's cool. So I could I could see if, if I was in Mike's domain, giving that to students and say, can I ship today? And hoping that they ask questions to say, right. well, it depends, or what does the red mean? And yeah. so, uh, so if, so speaking of, of questions, is there, do you find in each of your domains, and Adam, I'll stay with you first for this one, um, what questions have each of your audiences had that you were um, excited to answer, that showed that you got through or they were on to the right subject, they're, they're on to something? Um, mm -hmm. Is there an example of that where you felt you, you broke through? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, I was at a startup. We got acquired. I wound up spending a year in Virginia. I'm in, I'm in Toronto, Canada. Um, and I gave that exact graph or the exact picture to the product manager at, at the company in Virginia. And he actually read it and he's like, I think you have a problem in your graph. And he's like, what I would do is if I didn't test the build today, but I tested it yesterday, I would just pull the green status over onto the new build. And he's like, yeah, but you didn't actually test it. And I was like, wow you're actually paying attention because <laughs> I didn't think of that. And I'm super happy that a product manager is thinking that way. And I, I beamed in, even though it was like, there was a mistake in my thing, but I changed how I set the chart out. So if we didn't test it, that was why there was some white cells in there. Like if we didn't test it, we didn't color, we didn't carry on the status. We didn't just, we didn't go in and purposely try to discover any new information, but this this will drive a, a discussion around bug metrics. So I have another graph where the follow on is um, buggy components. And so mm -hmm. I can tell you areas of the product that might have a quality problem just by going into the bug tracking system and pulling the components that, um, you know, based on what we've put in there. And sometimes the data needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Like you can see here, like there was, a couple in there that were blank but you know we definitely have something going on in the server side here like what's let's dig into that and figure out is there is there a bigger problem here um with with this stuff and then it was a java web server so that was a nightmare but um <laughs> so that that turning it it that first graph leads to questions about well what what are the problem areas and then you you start getting away from test cases run and you start getting into like look here <laughs> look at these places um and there's one other thing that I'll I'll add and then I'll stop <laughs> and and Rob Sabrin um also mentored me in my early career and he reminded me of this the other day of I used to do this thing when we got to a release 
I would send out um, almost like a newspaper article. And it was like, the headline was, here are the top 10 things people might say about our software. And that got a lot of attention. People read it. And it was like, uh, it was a curated list by me and my team. And it was, it was like, th these are the important, these are what we think are the important issues. And it turned the conversation from uh, executives often have the view that, you know, uh, testers are, are like Gandalf, you, you shall not pass. Um, mm -hmm. And um, um, I view it more like Sherlock Holmes investigative thing and um, uh, lost the train of thought. Um, oh, I was talking about, oh, yeah, the, the article. Um, people would really take that article to heart. And that was really effective. Like it, the CEO read it. <laughs> like it was like, yeah. now it become, now I kind of subtly put it back onto them instead of having them proactively come to me and say, can we ship? I'd be like, Hey, before you ask, here's the things that I know about. Um, my professional opinion, you know, items two and three on the list. Yeah. They're really bad. We should probably fix them. I don't really know the business context enough to know about the other items. So what do you, what do you think? And I would kind of preempt the question, if you know what I mean, like I wouldn't get the, I wouldn't let them get to me like, Hey, do you think we can ship today? <laughs> yeah. Right. So that, that's an interesting technique, this newsletter and a, to see if you get a response to connote that it was being read and a reaction to some of the, yeah. some of the components in the newsletter to, to see that you might've landed with some of your concerns or risks or something. Right. Uh, Awesome. Uh, so, Mike, same question to you. You're up there in the front of the, the lectern, and you get a feeling that you've broken through with a particular uh, reaction to your students. Um, what? Tell me more about wh what that's been like for you in those moments. Okay. Well, I'm going to be real blunt and say that I don't often know immediately whether they got it. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that we have. 30 to 40, maybe even 50 uh, students that are that are uh, in the classroom. And I think you've been to my class a few times. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we try to get questions, usually get questions from the three, same three or four or five people. Uh, and the tendency is uh, uh, because we we have a lot, a very diverse uh, student body, but a lot of them are real shy about trying to express whether they got it or not in front of a big crowd. So I often don't immediately know uh, whether they got it. I might know one or two students that, that seem to be uh, engaged in, in you know, some of the questions that I fire off. So here is a technique that I will show that I do, do uh, during the lecture. So let me share my screen. And I will need audience participation on this one. Um, okay, so sometimes when I am doing a lecture, uh, I will often ask questions certainly during it, but I've often found that there's this uh, tool that I use in PowerPoint, Pull Everywhere, uh, that enables me to interject these type of uh, survey questions directly into the response. So if the audience wouldn't mind, um, I'd like them to answer it. And I will actually do this as I would in a class, because I think what you'll find is that as the answers start to come in, I then start reacting to them. Uh, and it gives me kind of a gauge whether or not they are understanding the concept. So I, for this particular one, um, oops, I didn't mean to move that. Uh, but go ahead and if you could just uh, answer that question and let's see if they come in. Hopefully the technology will work. I've had a number of times where it hasn't, but uh, if you if you respond, if you text that into your phone or go to this polyv.com, this will be, uh, you can type in whole sentences. And what I usually like to do is to respond as questions come in. Okay, so basically uh, automated testing, shorting testing times. So I would make a con, a con you know, a, a thing saying, yes, that's a, you know, that is, it can, it can be done. Sometimes I'll point out some of the drawbacks uh, because again, they're answering in one sentence, uh, help test with many combinations of, of test data. Uh, certainly combination testing is one of a benefit. Uh, let's see if we get some other responses. 
uh, might make regression easier. Of, of course, uh, sometimes the only way to test a certain problem is through that. Uh, I'm glad your brother's not here. Uh, it saves time <laughs> and eliminates human error, uh, sense of coverage that might be beneficial. And again, uh, this just kind of gives, I think it helps the class as a whole feel like they're uh, doing it in pos positive affirmation on my part, I think helps the process and also enables me to clarify if there is some uh, types of things. So I'll stop the share here, but thank you guys for participating on that. Um, I think, uh, um, as you, go ahead, John, uh, John you had. I'm just going to pivot to something. Uh, uh, as, a, as an instructor, you're also in the business of, of testing your students by. Yeah, I was going to mention that next. Um, <laughs> so, have, exam, so, like an example exam question or something that you might ask them to? Uh, it's okay if you don't. I don't put you on the spot. But, I, but let me just kind of uh, say what I think we should do as, as instructors. Uh, I think I have over 33 different assignments for the students over 10 weeks. There's a lot. And Adam's kind of going. And not it, they're, they're short ones, though. Uh, the group assignment that you get during um, during that, they, they turn it in as a group. Uh, they get uh, an assignment usually once a week. And then I'm also using this, uh, this tool called Zybooks, which is an interactive testing site. Uh, not, not software testing, but it's interactive uh, where they have different computer science uh, subjects and other subjects uh, to where students can also interact directly with it. Maybe a little bit later I, I could show that show off. Um, but that, and then of course we have exams and we have quizzes. So this gives me an idea uh, as I grade them, um, essentially where they're at. And it gives me the, the ability when we when we do grade, we also have the ability to respond, to give feedback. Um, again, I try to also stay in the positive when they when they definitely nail it. But uh, when they do miss it, we call the deduction. We don't say you you failed. We just say, you know, it's, it's a learning opportunity. Um, and uh, they get feedback that way. That that will also enable me to kind of know whether they get it. Uh, because again, I have them for 10 weeks. And part of uh, a good teacher's job, in my opinion, is to to give them these these opportunities to to sh show off their work, to test their what they're learning in this crap. So uh, hopefully by the end of the class, uh, they will, you know, obviously have a number of uh, times where they've been tested and hopefully it'll it generally does. They, they generally get pretty good grades. Uh, so that's that's yeah. been the good thing. That's when I know for sure. So yeah. that, that, yeah. the aha yeah. moment doesn't happen for me as much as maybe it does for Adam in, in more of that uh, setting. But but as students, uh, because they're a little bit more shyer and they, they do test uh, things in those ways, that's how I do it. Great. Um so just a, a program note here at 6.45, so 10 minutes from now, I'll, I'll open up the floor to to everyone for questions. So so 10 more minutes of my questions, then I'll hand it over to, to the audience. Um, so if I, okay. Could I just ask a follow-up yeah. on what Mike just yes. said? No. Um, one part of my background that I didn't introduce is after my robot work, I actually went and taught high school grade 11 entrepreneurship and accounting. So oh, I, nice. I have a lot of empathy oh. for, for you. Um, hey. And uh, I wanted to ask if any of your students ever come back to you uh, um, talking about the topics that you have taught them. Have you ever? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, mostly it's just appreciation. I get a number and, and I get a lot of appreciation right before I do the grades. But uh, but uh, the genuine appreciation that I do that, that I do value more is the LinkedIn um, uh, things because I do stay in contact with my former students. And some up times out of the blue, they they will uh, they'll just um, they will say how much they you know that this uh, skill helped them to get the job at Microsoft, and that's that goes to another question you might be asking us later is why we do it. For me, it's it's purely uh, want to help them on their next journey, which is often to get uh, a job in the industry. Uh, so yes, they do they do come back and um, appreciate that. I think you get the aha moment. You just get it later on, right? <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's like it's really like planting seeds. You know, right, you, exactly. you throw them out there. You you exactly. might not see it grow right away, but if uh, but down the line, and I think we we kind of know that event. You know, even if they don't come back and, and show verbal appreciation, that we did our best, and hopefully it'll help. Yeah. Now you say that one of these days you're going to be in Adam's position where you're going to be explaining software testing status to an executive. 
and they're, you're not going to get through, which leads me, Adam, to my, my next question is the opposite. So when do you, when have you felt where you haven't broken through to an executive? I know your time is much shorter than, than Mike's uh, in a board meeting or a pitch meeting, but times where you've, you've given your best explanation perhaps, and it just, it didn't land or they give you some signal like, nope, I don't, I don't buy it. Yeah, I, I unfortunately have a lot of examples, so I have to find the appropriate one to pull on. Um, but I, the one I, I kind of have in my mind was I implemented session-based testing. I had moved away from test cases. I was doing all the fun things that I showed you, and the project manager in meetings was all bought in and then eventually came to me and was like, no, but when will you be done? And I'm like, it, it doesn't work that way. What, what do you, what do you, did you listened, right? You were in the meeting and you, you nodded your head along, like, and, and, and he's like, no, but no, but that's not, like, just give me the answer, Adam. Like, just tell me. And I like, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to do right now. Like, I don't have the test case count that you want me to. So then that's, it, it just happened to coincide when you and your brother and some of the context driven community were starting to talk about session based metrics. And so that kind of act, it was just a nice coincidence. And so we started down that route of giving, ses giving session metrics and that made them happy. But I, for a while was really struggling and I'll say a while being like six to eight months. Now he was a peer. I didn't have to worry about him. I have run into people who were my bosses that I just couldn't convince. And then there comes a point where I'm like, I think I need to leave because you just, they just have such a traditional view of QA that nothing I say to them. And, and I used QA on purpose. I don't use that word. <laughs> um, I use software testing. And if I can't get them to understand the difference, I, I know that my time is limited um, and that they're probably going to want to bring someone in that speaks their language, makes them feel more comfortable. And I failed somewhere along the journey of meeting them where they're at and trying to to bring them along and it's just it's just not working um I, I, unfortunately i've run into two or three people like that um most of my career has been with people that once i once i kind of get show them the alternatives they get it but you don't always get through to everybody Interesting. So you, so you and Mike have both said this about journey. Some, someone being on a journey, and you both being like Sherpas and guides yeah. uh, in that journey. Um, and and so I want to, uh, with five minutes left before we go to Q and A, um, I I want to um, uh, throw to Mike here about um, maybe some an example of something about software testing or development that you wish you had known either when you started uh, in uh, business or academia and that you either incorporate into your teaching because you want your students to know it? Um, is there something that stands out for you of, of that, of some, some really important um, element of, of your work that you need to get across so others don't make the same mistake you might've made with not knowing something? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll point it out. Um... And I give credit to my colleague who might be watching this on YouTube later. So, uh, but I uh, I was uh, uh, I co-taught with a professor at CLU called Mike Keenig, and he is just the the most staunch advocate of unit testing code coverage that I've ever seen. He was the the one who who basically on every project that he's done, and he's done a number of side projects, 100% code coverage. <clears throat> and I thought that was kind of uh, that seems a little way way too ambitious and. Um, but as as I kind of was mentored under him, and then I uh, when I co-taught, and then now I'm doing these classes independently, uh, I really uh, I get the sense that how important it really is at at the developer level that they do uh, that they really make that a, an important part of, of of their development activities, and and so I I did not as a developer myself I did not always practice it as much as now I'm teaching it. So it's, it seems a little bit hypocritical. Um, but, it, but again, the question was what 
did you, <laughs> you know, how have you evolved? And and so this has been a growing experience for me in, in the academia and being under, um, you know, being uh, seeing another person, seeing it in action and seeing how it uh, has really benefited to the point now where uh, I've really made that a, a major part of any class that I make. Uh, the problem I have currently is with capstone groups because sometimes I let them decide their, uh, I advise and I let them kind of go their own way. And sometimes they choose to, uh, to not really make that a priority. And that, and that's where, uh, when you ask the, the prior question about where, you know, you're, where you're a little bit frustrated and disappointed, um, uh, it's a little bit frustrating that, you know, when you've taught them the value of this, that when they're, when you give them the keys to the car and they're on their own, uh, they don't practice it. Um, so that kind of dovetails to that, to the question you asked prior. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, Adam, same question. Um, something that you wish you would, had known earlier and you want to make sure it comes out in your presentation or your pitch to the C level uh, or whoever you're pitching to. Yeah, I, I think that for me, one of the things that I've really internalized over the last few years is that quality is a relationship. And when people say there's a quality problem, it it really is about a relationship to something that's not being met. And I know we used to talk about this when I was actually in testing and I knew it logically, but I had never found a way to internalize it myself so that I could meet the person where they're at. And I think that that's been my journey is meeting them where they're at. And there's, there's some other material, like I, I haven't, had a chance to talk about the great stuff that I did with Rob and, and the just in time testing and all the, you know, all the things there's a ton of things underneath the covers here, but because we're just talking at the executive level, like the way that I would present my methodology now would be different. And I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll close with one point. This is the most effective way I've seen. And it's not even my work. It's Jonathan Cole. He drew this in, uh, I think I found it in 2010, but this, this has actually gotten me jobs. I brought this to an interview and I've said, this is the way I think about software testing. I leave Jonathan's name on it. I'm not taking credit for his work. And he knows this, I've told him, but it's like, this is, this is how I think about things. And this is what I do. Um, it, like, does this make sense to you? And I kind of get a check um, and I, I wish I had learned to do that check up front more frequently, if you know what I mean, um, because it would it might have saved me in, in a few in a few areas. So I think in summary, just more meeting them where they're at, bringing them along and talking more about that picture that I just showed of like this. This is what good testing really looks like. You might be used to the test case style, but you're not really getting what you need, but not making them wrong about it. Um, yeah. I'm learning I'm learning to play guitar and you know you can go on YouTube these days and watch videos of all the famous guitar players and they're they're totally jamming out and you're like man will I ever be there and sometimes it's not useful to watch those people it's like no go back and go, go watch a beginner right and then figure <laughs> out what's the beginner struggling with cuz cuz that's actually where I'm at I'm at the yeah. beginner stage there's no needed me watching all these guys that like I can't even strum to for, for 30 yeah. seconds straight right so you know you can sometimes set the vision too far ahead of where people are and and that's what I've learned is like yeah. go back and, and and increment on your vision and get them to where you want incrementally yeah there there are even videos of professional guitarists throwing their guitars away when they see a virtuoso Right. And they're depressed. They're right. crestfallen, right? So it's okay. normal, a normal affect. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. So I, I have a few more questions and maybe we'll get to them, but I'd like to throw it to the audience now. So um, so I assume everybody's mic is open, uh, Shelly, for, for Q&A. Um, uh, fair game. What, uh, anything that you've got uh, to ask Mike or Adam about presenting or teaching software testing to different audiences? If there's no questions, that's fine because I have a few more. No. Uh, I have one, John, if you if you want. Yes, Mr. Sabrin, good to see you. Fire away. So, so I love I love being on both sides of this equation. It's it's wonderful and it's very challenging problem space that you're discussing. So thanks for doing this, John. It's wonderful. 
Um, what what I've learned the biggest difference between teaching people academically and teaching people ex executive stakeholders professionally is that the learning objectives are dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And the hard thing for me has always been to identify what part of the executive mindset that I have to sort of get them to unlearn. Whereas the, the, the and I don't want to use terms coarsely, but the virgin mindset, for me, it's an easy, it's a fertile ground. I can feed them all sorts of ideas and let the opportunities grow. But I just want to sort of sort of ask both of you, what, what concepts have you had to sort of help people unlearn? And uh, that's that. I'll leave that as a question. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Rob. Great talk so far. I I can start, Mike. If that's yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, the concept that a hundred percent unit test coverage equals high quality. That by far is the one way. And I know, Mike, you said that. And I'm not. I'm not knocking you. No, not, with but, your students, but but I agree with you know, that. I, I had a client who was trying to, uh, this was in my consulting work, was trying to up their unit test coverage to nearly 100%, but at the same time, the software would not remain running. And so they, they were continuing to increase the unit test coverage, but they were getting nothing more in reliability and they were confused. And I, I struggled to really help them unlearn it. I don't think I was successful, um, to be honest, it was it just, they sometimes the ideas are so ingrained the number the the narcotic we used to call it the nar narcotic green bar right of unit test coverage um you know that that's the hardest thing to to unwind in people okay. Very good. uh i would say the definition of done <laughs> is something that uh uh, maybe I could, I would say, because uh, when you, when you're a student learning a craft for the first time, done means turning in an assignment, uh, following the happy path. Uh, perhaps you, you did a sort correctly and perhaps you did a search correctly. Um, but when we're talking about when we're actually, you know, making, maybe making it into a product or something more functional, that's where we start getting edge cases. That's where we start and so that definition of done means uh, expanding your code to handle uh, those those various conditions that will be encountered when they release it in academia. So I guess one of the challenges that I that I could probably make to my fellow professors, including myself, is to make their uh, uh, to start looking at edge cases a little bit, boundary cases. Just don't uh, you know look for the solution. Um, and so incorporate that aspect into, into it because definition of done is something that we say, you know, should pass. And again, I understand your, your, your point about unit tests, but certainly uh, definition of done for us, or at least for this last thing, was to make sure that all your unit tests passed, uh, that make sure that you had code coverage. So we had different criteria that we put into it. Uh, but that is uh, the def so a lot of students don't know that, so they had to unlearn it. Okay, let me stay with you, Mike, for, for another question from our audience from, from Wayne, um, who asks, uh, what would it take to get schools to introduce more testing curriculum? Um, decades of interviewing candidates for testing positions, he says we almost never found anybody with prior education on the topic, but it's, so it seems ripe potential, he says. So what would it take to get schools to introduce more? Um, well, I think the first thing is we need to, uh, to elevate what a tester is. Uh, and so that I think to, to, we might need to do that even to the faculty to, uh, to so that they understand that uh, that it's not you know it's not a second tier type job but it's actually a very critical type of uh, activity and it's it's certainly part of of learning computer science and learning software engineering so uh, I think we might just start with the faculty first and then I I think because usually when we start with the faculty they're they're involved with curriculum decisions. And that can influence the potential curriculum that we would then uh, take. Okay. I second I second that in that one of the issues is people see testing as a lesser than role. And it's only because they've seen really crappy testing, I believe. And I still have engineers reach out to me from my testing days to tell me that they remember the caliber of testers that we had because we could all code if we wanted to. We just chose not to write code on a deadline, but automation when you're writing it is actually a development project and you need to treat it that way. You need to, and people don't realize that. It's not like you just throw some people at it and then it works. Um, so yeah, 
getting people to realize that testing is not a lesser than job um, yeah. is, is critical. It's it's not uh, just for the audience's benefit. Currently, it's not a required course for the under, to get a computer science undergraduate degree. It's introduced. Uh, we do have a specialized class in it at the graduate level, but only if you go take the software engineering track, which about probably one third of our grad students do. And that those are the ones that are looking into, you know, the whole a lot of the different disciplines of software engineering. So it's not a required course, at least at Seattle University. And I would imagine probably other universities, too, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Dwayne, I see your hand up. Uh, I'll take you next and then Alifa, I'll take yours in chat. So, Dwayne, go ahead. OK, cool. Hi. Um, I um, am a QA engineer who is morphing into the project management slash scrum master space. Um, I know in my experience, I've had problems trying to explain QA to other scrum masters and project managers because they, they just don't understand what QA does and vice versa. Um, do you find it? I, how do you find it the best to describe it to like scrum masters and project managers who come from a business background and not necessarily a technical background? Mm -hmm. And um, do you see like a lot of strengths in like someone become, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about myself in someone becoming a scrum master coming from a technical background as opposed to like a business background. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I'm guessing that's directed more at me. Than Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> Either. <laughs> yeah. Um, my my experience in that was I you really need to do a strong job at educating them um, on two things: confidence in the software and risks of the software or in the software. So that's how if I were to explain it to a layman business person, my job is to help you be confident that we can ship the software and that we know about the important problems before we ship. We can't always find all of them, but we do our best to find most of them before we ship. We're like the goalie and you can put whatever sports analogy because I'm Canadian, I'll use hockey and the Vegas one and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, you can't catch everything, but you do your best and it has to get through five other people on a hockey team before it gets to the goalie. You, you kind of you can play with that analogy a little bit. It can fall off the rails because then they'll be like, well, we'll just replace the goalie. Okay, fine. <laughs> but I think what it comes down to for me is explaining that my job is to help you make confident business decisions. And you need to have confidence in the software. And I've used cars as an, uh, an analogy. I've used other topics as an analogy of like, I'm the test driver. I'm the test pilot. Uh, you built the F-17 or the whatever jet, and I'm taking it out for flight. And I'm I'm giving it a go through its paces. And I'm coming back and I'm giving you my thoughts on it. Um, and that's the value I provide. You don't really care when you get on an airplane, how many checks the pilot ran through in his pre-flight check. What you would want to know is, did he skip a couple? <laughs> right? Um, you know, that's, that's important to me. And that was actually one thing that I used to talk about that I didn't mention, just to tag it on. I used to tell people what I wasn't going to test. And that was really important because it was eye-opening. You, you put that in front of some people. There were people in the marketing team that thought that we tested everything all the time. And I'm like, no, I don't test everything all the time. But internally in engineering, I'd be like, you are not changing these areas, so I'm not going to test them. And then you just watch people's responses. And I would. it's not like I was dogmatic about it. If they told me, no, you need to test this, I'd be like, all right, fine, I'll, I'll test this we'll 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 move it around but i think just bringing it back confidence and risk if you can find different ways to explain that different analogies different uh angles for them um that's what's been most effective for me now i'd like to stay with you adam on that thread because it, it's almost as if you're answering uh, a question alifa has asked in chat about they she tried to uh, they tried to create report by yeah. telling the the product test effort professional opinion but they don't get a response what do you think that they can do as testers to get more engagement to their testing report? You know, I, I read that and and just to not repeat what I just spent two minutes saying, um, the, the right, right. thing I would do is I would meet with people one on one and I would go through it. I, I would treat it like uh, an investigative reporter. Hey, I'm writing this thing for you. Hey, tell me what you see here. 
Is this useful to you? What would you like to know? What am I not telling you that you would like to know? What would make you read this and really get curious and, and don't attack them for not reading your stuff because that's never helpful. But, um, you know, what what could I do to make this more helpful for you? And my top 10 list that I mentioned earlier, that got attention, that got CEO level attention, right? Like talk to the CEO, book a coffee chat with the CEO and be like, hey, if I told you, you know, my professional opinion on what I thought might be wrong with the software and I vetted it with a few people, would that be useful information to you? Um, and just see, maybe they don't want to know. Maybe they're, I've had CEOs where it's like, la la la, la you know, um, but you, if if you're not getting any response and you're you're kind of doing the things that I suggested, you got to go down a layer and go one on one and just get really curious. All right, uh, this one comes in, and Michael, I want to throw to you on this one. Um, Harry, uh, hi Harry. Uh, Harry asks, um, what types of software do you have your students test? What types of software? Um, okay. Uh, Again, we do do a lot of theory, but the ones that I really like is that we do have a uh, one of the projects that we do is is to take an open source project out there that is not does not have unit test coverage to learn it. I'm not that picky on what they pick, and they will um, you know they have to build it, they have to run it. Their job is not to fix the bugs, but their job is to uh, do, do do exploratory testing and to also provide unit testing for it. That's one relevant assignment that I do like to do. And the last big one that we did is the quarter long one that is to essentially uh, C sharp using blazer racer uh, web website development and we actually uh, kind of go more into that those kinds of details uh, the technology I find is not that big a deal to be honest with you I, I think just the the act of actually doing testing uh, and also to do an exploratory testing now we haven't really covered that I've been talking about unit testing but my big deal right now is a lot of times students, when they get a finished product, don't really go through uh, the aspects of, of actually uh, exploratory testing, and and that's my job. So because I, um, when I when I get their finished products, I will then try to break it. And uh, if if students don't even do the, just some of the real simple things, uh, they they won't get get the better grades. So those are kinds of things that um, that I do for for assignments. Same thing happens in industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that's true, at least through my experience too. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, and Adam, when you've done like a tutorial, or or maybe there are executives in the audience that you've taught at a conference, perhaps, are there any um, testing uh, tools or exercises that like maybe your one or top two, one or one or two favorites that you use to impart uh, good testing techniques? We used to have these tchotchkes. I was telling the story earlier today. We used to have a clock that we that had our logo on it. And as you, it was a square. As you turned it, it did the time and an alarm and uh, calendar and temperature. And I would actually give that to people in an interview and ask them to test it. And then you can't kind of look silly if you say like, I don't have the requirements. But that's one where it lands with a lot of people. Give them something. I used to give them something physical um to test and ev everybody can get it and usually i do that with executives when i want to open up their idea uh, idea generation machine so uh, that's where rob sab and the and the jit work comes in and you really get into like you know it, sales guys use the sell me a pen as their exercise right so i use the Here's a clock. Let's see how many test cases. Te Sorry, I said the ooh, bad slip. Uh, let's have, see how many test ideas we can generate in 15 minutes, right? And then you know, set a timer and let's let's go. Um, that one seems to work. Um, you can do that casually over lunch. You don't have to even have to do that. Yeah, but, you know, great. Uh, okay, last question, and this is for both of you. And uh, Adam, I'll stay with you. Um, as you've heard Mike's answers, what strikes you as profoundly similar or profoundly different about each of your domains? Yeah, I think um, I think the journey is it, the struggle is real. I think it it Mike's earlier in the journey. It's great to hear that that there's people out there that are that are teaching this. I only really knew of Rob Saab teaching this stuff before before tonight. 
And it's there's there's common problems, there's common themes and in, in the industry, and it starts really early. Um, so that was it, the part about, you know, even faculty believe that software testing is kind of a second class activity um, is telling, right? So there's more work to do. So there's still more on the journey and uh, I'm excited to have people like Mike uh, on it with us. So. Awesome. All right, Mike, same question. If you've heard, as you've heard Adam's answers, Similarities or difference that is profound. Then, um, well, I learned I learned a lot from Adam. Um, I didn't, to be honest with you, uh, when you said to executives, I really I thought software testing to executives that doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, my my experience is that the uh, they, they wanted to work, but they I don't know to to try to explain that to them um, seemed a little bit uh, interesting to me because I haven't seen that so much when I was consulting and stuff. Uh, so just uh, hearing some of the different approaches that he takes to explain it to that uh, type of audience uh, and some of the techniques that he does, because I do talk about how you do talk to managers uh, as when you're when you're a developer or an engineer or even a consultant. And so it was kind of refreshing and interesting to hear how uh, Adam goes about it. Great. Well, gentlemen, we're at time. Thank you so much for being my guest uh, in this session. Uh, written a few notes. Uh, oh, one thing I meant to ask, um, uh, you mentioned Zybooks, and I don't know how to spell that, or for those in the audience. Oh, uh, Z-Y-B-O-O-K-S. -O -O okay, it is with a Y. Okay, got it. Yeah, Perfect. it's, it's, uh, um, it's, I mean, there's lots of similar types of products out there, but but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it really effective to include it in, in my courses as a way of supplementing uh, what they might have missed in lecture, and they want to because there's lots of different ways to learn. <laughs> so uh, you can learn through, you know, through voice, by doing, and this is, and by book. And this is another way. Uh, okay. Um, I think, Shelly, we're good on, uh, good on time. Uh, that is, I think that is it. Uh, Joe, any, any last words before we wrap up? Okay. That's yeah, I think that's great. Thank you guys so much for Thank you. everything you've shared with us today. It's been really fantastic. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can find uh, Adam there. and Mike on LinkedIn. Um, so give them a shout out. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. There's one other thing I thought I'd add because I was, when I was listening to everybody's talks, and I, when I started this out, and I, I mentioned that I mostly have talk to executives about software quality. But when I've talked to, I, I guess, employees really about software quality, I've tried to convince them to go beyond just software testing. Of course, everybody has to press all the buttons and make sure everything works, right? But to go into the realm of consultative testing, where you say, I've seen so many different pieces of software and there might be a more elegant way for you to approach this one little problem. <laughs> and it really, really goes a long way, I think. And it, it's a good message to the executives. It's a good message to the testers too. But thank you everybody for your wonderful input and for joining us tonight. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you and Shelly for hosting. And uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will be up Thanks, John. Yeah, well, yeah, the video will be up. Okay, thank you guys. Have a great, have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.